a much more comfortable uh, as a pacer and a standard, of course. Listen, what I did, I, I didn't bring out any of my slides because as I thought about it, uh, what I thought I knew two weeks ago when I was invited to come out here is hardly what I know, I think, now after about a week here in Israel and learning. So what I wanted to do is just talk about, say, three subjects that involve, say, a convolving of what I think I do know from my long experience with what I've been learning here. And I'd like to address then, generally say, the subjects of my personal opinion of what it's going to take to really monetize gas in this basin. Two, I'd like to talk about what interests me more than anything else, and that is how do we find oil in this basin and exactly where do we go? And lastly, I had a couple of ideas, wild ideas about research that I would be interested in. And that's the test for me. Is it something that I don't know and I'd be interested in? Uh, as is obvious, I'm the oldest man in the room here yet again. I've been in this business nearly 60 years. Uh, and I'm still on the dead run. I'm given uh, four or five scientific talks, including an AAPG talk this year. I still publish a paper or two every year. And with our family company, uh, I have four geologists in my family. Uh, we're all active there in Roxanne Oil, and it's a very nice thing to be working with your own children. Well, one of the things I learned coming here, I ran across a wonderful, wonderful quote by uh, that famous lady, Golda Meir, who said that uh, uh, Moses dragged the Jews through the deserts for 40 years and took them to the only place in the Middle East that doesn't have any oil. Now, I'd like to make a correction. Moses found the promised land. That was his job. It's our job to find the oil, kids. And that's what we're going to be doing. Now, I have no experience in developing gas in deep water. Almost no one does. If anything, you may be in advance of the rest of the world in trying to do it. I have had a fair amount of experience, though, in other parts of the gas development business. I've been responsible for developing six international gas fields. All of those were connected by pipeline onshore and sold internally. They, we didn't think they were easy at the time. One pipeline went from Bali to Jakarta and was the first ever contract selling gas to a host country in that region. Can you imagine when I go to see the petroleum minister and tell him that we're going to be asking him to pay $6 a thousand for 4 trillion cubic feet of gas? I thought he'd say, thank you, Mr. Downey. He said, you're, you are going to be selling me my gas? And because you're going to have those problems because the hard part isn't finding gas. I hate to say it, even with my wonderful people from Noble here, 
Finding gas is easy. Developing gas in deep water is very difficult. And if you want to talk difficult, try selling it to another country. Gas contracts in that magnitude and type are not legal documents. They are exchanges of hostages. Think of yourself, say, suppose yourself walking in to talk to the petroleum minister in, say, Turkey, and say, oh, I've got 16 trillion cubic feet of gas to sell for you. I'm only asking $8 a thousand. You, of course, will need to give me an irrevocable commitment to take or pay for 30 years. Folks, do you begin to see where the hard part of the business is going to be in making money with gas? And it absolutely requires, as Mike hinted the other night, that the governments of Israel and probably Cyprus be rock solid in their support of Noble and the companies that are going to be marketing this gas. Rock solid. Because at the end will be government to government uh, deals with Noble, say, being in the unfortunate middle position. Now, One reason why these things are exceptionally difficult is that the costs are likely not engineering costs. What do I mean by that? Well, our wonderful engineers will give us costs to do these things. But when you're in the middle of international negotiation, country to country, Delays are routine. And for those of you who are more scientists than financial people, perhaps I could point out that with the cost of capital of a big company or a bank being, say, 12%, if you've got a $20 billion project and it's delayed six years, it just costs you $40 billion. Cyprus and Israel have a wonderful chance, if they do it right, to be one of the handful of countries that have a reputation for honoring contracts and behaving according to the rule of law. You can count on the fingers of one hand how many places in the world you can invest $10 billion and be confident that the country, the law, will back you up. I would like to see you folks be one of those countries. Currently, you got, uh, you've got Australia, Canada, UK, Norway, and the US, and I don't count, say, Holland or something like that, but that's, that's, those are the places that are willing to do this. Well, Mike also alluded, and I wanted to follow up with how much gas is there out there right now. Lordy, lordy, uh, we've got more gas than cents in this world right now. And as you develop your gas, once you leave Israel, you're at the mercy of the market. You have one of the most wonderful things you can have in Tamar Discovery and its connection. That's truly a God. After that, folks, it's really, really hard. For that reason, let me move on towards uh, the way I think after Tamar you make money in the oil business. It's finding oil. 
That's how you make money in the deep water in Israel or Cyprus or any other place. That's my business. That's all I do is find oil and gas. And do you know how to find oil and gas? I think you've got a ways to go. I notice as I watch the technical presentations, I see all sorts of wonderful science. But I like to think, can I use the word anthropomorphic? I like to think like oil thinks. I like to visualize how oil will behave when I'm looking for it. And let me give you an example. Environments of deposition, oil doesn't care. Stratigraphy, oil doesn't care. Rock type, oil doesn't care. All oil cares about are the very few simple laws that govern its movement. And that's its buoyancy pressure and the capillary entry pressure of whatever it encounters. That's all it cares about. It doesn't care about the building, uh, the rock. We have a lot of things that later on we can use to help us. But fundamentally, you got to think about finding oil from the standpoint of oil. And I know exactly where it is in your basin. And I saw hints that you know it. I saw a, uh, uh, a cross-section uh, by Mickey, uh, let's see, help me out in my names here. Argo. What? Argo. Yes, thank you. And on it, he had a, a um, two-dimensional cross-section superimposed, posing that depth that is the temperature field at which oil will be expelled as surely as the night follows the day from any organic matter in that basin, in that zone. Now what would do we need to do? Well, we need to do just one step further there, and that is A, change that from a cross section to a, what would you call it, a, a, a three-dimensional uh, surface. That's our target. That's where the oil is. I guarantee it. That's the physics of oil and gas. Now, when we drill to it, um, we will certainly find oil being generated. We'll start with that to look at those, those structures, those faults, those reservoirs that are closely adjacent. It won't be far away. Lordy, we're almost lack, we're lacking an astounding amount of oil shallow. This is not the Gulf of Mexico in which oil is as common shallow as it is deep. The oil here is deep. It ain't where you want it to be. Oil doesn't play hide and seek, nor does it go to where it's easy for you. It only goes where it's generated, and it'll be deep in the basin. Um, and since um, I have heard only the same things you have, I think I can tell you that my interpretation of the little bit of data that I have heard, I think that our friends at Noble have drilled that, have encountered that, and I'd be willing to bet any of you a substantial sum of money that they have penetrated, pressured, gas and oil in at least the source rock that we're looking for. I'm waiting for the rest of you to get smart and do that kind of drilling. Uh, lastly, I don't want to drone on here, kids. Uh, uh, let me mention some odd things that I'd be interested in if you have uh, any of your grad students uh, need something to do. Uh, I'm. Uh, Surprised how little work we're seeing on um, these immense 
bacterial gas uh, deposits that you have. Uh, you know, I've developed those around the world, uh, uh, but uh, uh, what I haven't ever understood is why we have more gas in some structures than others. I'd be interested if some bright people would show me how you actually sweep, accommodate, uh, uh, compact, focus bacterial gas in, say, Leviathan. I would also be interested in um, the peculiarities of the seal. Is the seal a semi-permeable membrane that is um, uh, uh, yielding as you put more gas in it? Or is it an unusual rock type that's trapping that bacterial methane? And the last thing, and perfectly ridiculous, is, is Leviathan a sustainable resource? Now, I don't really think that we'll replace it as we produce it, but what will happen? What will happen when I take 16T out of that structure, lower the pressure for bacterial gas? I think that's worthy of a grad student study. And with that, uh, I'll only close by saying I really appreciate your being kind enough to invite me out here. Uh, at my age, the, one of the few things I enjoy are good meals and really, really bright people to talk to. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.